coastal Mississippi experiences some of the most severe storm surge inundations on Earth. Storm surges are massive saltwater floods that are the deadliest, costliest natural disaster on the planet. The shallow offshore water and proximity to the near right angle along the coast at Louisiana's Mississippi River Delta traps water in this region and officially piles up coastal flooding. Hurricane Katrina's 28-foot storm surge and Hurricane Camille's 24-and-a-half-foot storm surge both peaked at past Christiane, Mississippi, close to the body of water known as Bay St. Louis. These are the two highest coastal floods generated by a hurricane on record in the Western Hemisphere. I recently drove around coastal Mississippi with a structural engineer named Scott Sunberg. He educated me about how to build better for both strong wind and high floods in this region as we drove around and looked at examples of both good and bad construction. This podcast is a recording of our conversation as we explored the coast. My background is geography and climate science, so sometimes he had to clarify terminology for me. I left many of these teaching segments in the podcast as I saw them as opportunities to educate our listeners. You'll love this episode if you live in a place vulnerable to extreme storm hazards like hurricanes or tornadoes. This episode is also very valuable for professionals working in architecture, design, construction, as well as those involved in flood mitigation. If you're new to the podcast, GeoTrek travels the world to find stories about the relationship between people and nature. Our stories investigate the impact of extreme weather, disasters, and hazards on individuals and communities. Our goal is to help you better understand how the world works so you can take actions to make yourself, your family, and your community more resilient to all the extremes that Mother Nature can throw at us. Hey, before we start this episode, we have a favor to ask of you. We'd really appreciate if you'd subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Your subscription helps us mark progress, which enables us to make more professional partnerships moving forward and ensures many more episodes of the GeoTrek podcast in the future. Let's jump in the truck with Scott Sunberg and explore how we can build better in a disaster prone place like the Mississippi coast. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to uh, find this uh, concrete home. It was built in the 20s. Scott, let's talk a little bit about concrete while we're doing that. I asked you before we started this interview why we don't see more concrete in the U.S. It seems very resilient. Uh, and you had shared a few thoughts about that with me. Yes, it's it's actually a, you know, a good bit more expensive. It, it really does need to be engineered. And then you have the challenge that up until recently, you'd have hell to pay to find a, a residential contractor that could handle the job. So wood-based is so much more common, right? It has been. Now, uh, over in Bay St. Louis and uh, Waveland, along the coast you can see where a lot of contractors have picked up on it and hopefully they have had it engineered and it actually will perform uh, well for all that extra effort and time and money you think as we see more floods and things like that we'll see more concrete proportionally i think it's coming on strong and you know especially when you you look at uh you know how much people spend for Uh, homes I think it's a growing segment well Carl made a good point even if you pay a little more up front for some of these mitigation measures if you're saving a lot of hassle and a lot of time and a lot of stress and a lot of money in the cleanup after a big storm it may really pay off oh most certainly I mean why pay to build a, a wood house twice when you can build a concrete house once and it I've heard people argue you're actually going to come out better in the long run by building better like that. Oh, absolutely. What about these houses here where we see a lot of... Are those breakaway down below? They should be. They should be. And and by and large, most all of them are. And therein lies another problem, of course. But um, unfortunately, some builders don't pay attention to details and they don't really make sure they can break away. In other words, they make those walls and those lattice works uh, continuous across the column. Without openings. So what can happen is, is the hydraulic load, the wind and, I mean, well, the, the waves and the water will hit it and actually cause lateral load to the structure. Now, when I designed my home, we were in an A11 zone. And when you look back in the flood insurance study, other than Camille, that was more than adequate. But 
our yeah. community chose to put a minimum of a three foot uh, freeboard in. So we were actually in an A14 uh, zone. Now this home here was built somewhere around 1900 or so and the, the legend I've always heard is is that it was built by a, a grandfather and his granddaughter. It's it's very rugged. You can see the wood uh, formwork exposed in the relief pattern on the, on the walls. But this puppy has survived Camille and Katrina, both of which would have put uh, water into the second floor. It's a concrete design, right? Yeah. I've heard people say even if your concrete home gets flooded, you can to some degree muck it out and it's it's good to go. It should be, yes. Yeah. Is it true that in other countries you see a lot more concrete proportionally than here? That's what I've heard. Unfortunately, I've not been a world traveler. But, um, you know, part of that is to do with, in some other countries, they don't have as many forests. Right. Uh, I've heard, like, Bahamas, for example. They, oh, yeah. They build a lot with concrete. It makes sense. They probably have more sand available than trees, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, and then it may help them out. I've heard people say that they weather Category 4 and 5 hurricanes pretty well. Absolutely. And their infrastructure is designed far better to, to handle it. Instead of having power poles up in the air, you know, they probably have more underground. Yeah. But, you know, you think of poorer countries, I guess, uh, Turkey, Pakistan, and, you know, the, what, the Middle Eastern countries, where predominantly you'll see nothing but concrete homes. Much smaller, much more uh, less stylish, I suppose, but they're built to last. Uh, you know, they, they might build them piecemeal to get there, but they, they build them. Yeah, there is this concept that in a lot of other countries, people live in the home that their parents grew up in and their grandparents grew up in. And their homes are passed down from one generation to the next, maybe more frequently. And I think in the States, that's that's less frequent. Absolutely. You know, we, we build McMansions to, to be sold to the highest bidder when you can upgrade to something even bigger. So, Katrina, did the water start coming in your house? Was it all at once, or was it a slow rise over time? <laughs> the, the, we were um, renting a home over in Long Beach, and it was adjacent to a home that had uh, survived Camille. And as the water came up, at first I, I thought, you know, uh, my wife was the first to notice the water in the yard, and then we started noticing it coming up inside the house. And so it came up in a very quick but just a vertical fashion. The waves didn't come until the water was quite high. And then we had a portable greenhouse in the backyard, and as the waves started to come, it acted as a battering ram and took out the seaward wall, oh, wow. which started the, the collapse of the house. However, the water came up quick enough, and the waves such that we knew we had to abandon ship. So there was some depth to the water inside. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there was, like I say, eight, eight plus feet of water inside as we exited. Wow. And we swam out and got in our little sailboat that we had on a trailer. And then we tried to get back to the house to break into the second floor to see if we could uh, get our cats out. Sure, sure. And we could not. Uh, and then the uh, the house began, to, and more of the, the waves came and pushed us away from the house into a tree. And then we watched it just totally disintegrate. The house disintegrated. Yeah. You were in the sailboat that was um, getting close to the tree, and then the tree, you said, helped almost overturn the boat, It, right? it did, yeah. We sort of got caught in it, and then the, the waves capsized us. It was actually a very stable trimaran, but since it was on a trailer, the Amas were sure. pulled in, and so it wasn't that stable. So but. you could find some stability and some refuge in the, in the tree for a bit, right? Yeah, we did, and then we noticed that the... Time ran was floating right quite well upside down, so we clung on it for a while till the water receded right. enough that we could wade to uh, to like a shore house. and the, the neighboring house where uh, the waves had knocked out the entire first floor and then went inside it until the wind subsided. And uh, did your house completely disintegrate? Oh, absolutely! Yeah, down to the down to the slab. Post storm assessment. When you look around, are you surprised sometimes, or is it pretty much what you expected? The houses that survive are the ones you would have expected to survive. Pretty much what I expected. Uh, my wife and I would go through a, an exercise about you know when the next hurricane hits here, you know that's going. I tell her that one's going, that one's going, that one's going, 
Do you think the people that live in there know that, or do a lot of times they just don't know it? No, 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 there was no clue. So from a lot of people probably just assume all construction's the same, and they they don't really differentiate the way you would. See, we're a little higher, and and I know that one had survived, and now we're getting into some commercial structures again. We're, We're pretty high, and that structure survived. That one did. It's an old theater. They have not yet done anything to it. But whatever was here was gone. Everything on that side of the street was gone. And there's another Hancock bank made out of concrete. That one survived. Are they all made out of concrete? Their original ones were, you know, way back when. Yeah. You know, that was the thing. Build it to last. Build an asset, you know, self-insure. <laughs> build it as though you're going to insure it yourself. It's amazing how much different you would Oh, sure, then you think about it very different, right? Absolutely. And I'm dragging you down this area because it's it's really bizarre to see how different the construction, the reconstruction has been. This area was hit just tremendously hard. Uh, A lot of wave once, action, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. W- wave action out the wazoo. We're, we're coming off what is the only physical relief here <laughs> on this area. And, you know, this is an old Catholic church, so, I mean... It was built out of masonry. It survived. Um, And then we come to a a reinforced concrete structure here that was designed and built hell for stout. Uh, I actually had worked for the firm that had done that way back when. I wasn't there when they did it. That's how old it is. But they really did things strong. Now, see how low that one is? Yeah, yeah. Okay, now that one's higher. Yeah, look at that. And then you get a medium one. So, it, like I say, the reason I wanted to take you down this area is just to show you, Just it's bizarre. You have people building on wood columns, you have some concrete, some steel, up, down, just all over the page. Yeah, built to different levels. I'm seeing some elevators outside. People have those outdoor elevators. Yeah. I'm seeing some elevated air conditioning units that are at least 10 feet off the ground. Yeah. Things you wouldn't see in a lot of other parts of the country. Yeah, they like those uh, elevators outside that are unwalled in the... They're technically only for groceries, and therefore they don't have the same. The manufacturers don't have the same liability problems. Oh, I see. So people, in in theory, put their groceries in that and send them up. And themselves, but and they, yeah. <laughs> see, as long as they're classified that, then sure. the manufacturers off the hook. They feel, and then they don't have to pay as much for liability insurance, I and understand. they pass that on. Yeah. But you see, there is just brand new construction, and uh, you know it's basically wood. It's on a. Uh, basically a stem it appears to be a stem wall type of foundation because it looks pretty solid from here no uh, breakaway portions no columns really visible but see what's happening is is that you have a lot of these enclosures at grade that are just going to be utilized for all sorts of things outdoor uh, kitchens and, and now thanks to FEMA Art 2.0 they can be used as bedrooms Oh, really? Okay, now see there, you see an entire living level at virtually grade. Beyond it, you see something that's elevated so 16 feet. So is that feet. new policy with risk rating 2.0 that you can build the lower enclosure and have it habitable downstairs? That's what's going to happen by the insurance. Now, you might run into a problem with your local code enforcement if you're presently in a V zone. But part of what um, the risk rating... 2.0 is is that they can enforce or rate to new flood elevations without having to do a new firm. Sure, sure. Now, yeah, a couple of years ago, maps, right? yeah, a couple of years ago, they went through and modernized all of the maps to a digitalized version. But to go through and do a flood insurance study and do all of the hydrodynamic studies and the field reconnaissance to get the transects and so on and so forth to guesstimate these firms takes a lot of money and time. But then they run up against uh, opposition to from locals. Okay, now there you, you see <clears throat> concrete construction elevated fairly high so they can change your uh, flood policy without going through the, the firm 
So what will happen, oddly enough, is you're going to have older structures that were in an AE zone and have bedrooms and other things at a lower elevation, but there are some instances where they get these breaks in the insurance rates and won't be uh, risked, rated at a higher risk level. So in, in essence, there's going to be a problem where FEMA, I mean, actually NFIP is actually in, in subsidizing weak construction. I see, where people are more at risk than what they're paying for. Yeah, and because of the way they've collected data and restricted what data they actually use in all of this. Those are concrete piles, right? Well, columns, not the piles. Columns, not, not, not necessarily. Now, see, that's just it. Unless you actually watch the construction, you don't know if they drove concrete piles, which a few have, or that they put in a something of a foundation and then started up with a column. I see. Oh, I see. So the, it could be the foundation maybe goes below ground to two feet above, and then the column goes about, uh, starts on that. And right. And the footing's on that foundation. And maybe the column or the pile doesn't even go into the ground. Right, the column, yeah. When, when it's above ground, it's just a column. A so pile, it, technically, is really something that is in the ground. So it might continue above it, but it's definitely in the ground. And so, so a pile would really go below the ground. A column is above the ground. Right. So, I'm guessing that piles are much more resilient than columns. Is that true in general? No, it's or a different it purpose. I mean, te technically, a pile is a driven into the ground, and typically, more often than not, just a foundation support. Now, you can get long enough piles that will protrude above grade and become columns. And so that's a driven pile column. It's a hybrid. Yeah, how does that perform in general? Well, un unless it's extremely deep and it has some sort of a grade beam system uh, near the surface or just slightly below, it won't have the same moment capacity as other type systems. Now, take a look how high these are. Wow. And then they have an independent little enclosure there. Uh, all of them do. And see, that has a steel floor system. Now, here you have a wood column system. Now, sometimes, and that looks to be... Now, that looks to be a, a driven-type pile. Now, unless they got an inordinately long piles, it's hard to imagine that those piles have much of an embedment. Sure, sure. Getting 60-foot-long piles is very costly and uh, very rare. So chances are the embedment on those is, is very, very light. So when we see really Shallow. high houses on on high piles above ground, there's a good chance that the embedment isn't tremendous below ground. Right. right. Especially with wood. Now you can you can get hundred foot long concrete piles, but whether or not they're driven to that extent. Now here you get into yet another display of the variety here where you have these homes that are extremely elevated and then they have these interstitial floors. Now, I would hazard a guess that that one right there may be near or above the, the, uh, the BFE, if you will. But if it isn't, then that becomes, at best, debris. You mean that middle layer? That middle, yeah, level where it's just a, an open deck. That could be lodged out as debris, right? And yeah. Float in the water. And depending on how it's connected, it could actually have a detrimental impact on those very slender columns. There's a lot of them, a lot of columns. They're closely spaced in the rows. That's why we often look at that lower, har lowest horizontal member, right? That can really make a difference. Uh, it, it can, but that's actually a, a, a really complicated uh, subject. The lowest horizontal member goes back to the velocity zone yeah. designations where you could get wave action on that and it's actually the structure. This yeah. is sort of a new problem that is, has cropped up with elevating. It has, you know, become popular in Florida and Alabama where, you know, they'll elevate that high, but they want to have an outside deck to, to utilize that space. I see. So the living space is elevated higher, but then they're, they're putting a deck lower. Mm -hmm. And that deck, I mean, it is, it is debris. Would that change the designation of the first floor elevation? No, actually, as I understand it, and I've tried my best uh, due to self-interest <laughs> to continue reading on the newest rating, uh, procedure. It's supposed to be simpler. Uh, 
digression would be is the old system you you only had to look up two rates you know it was simple you know what flood zone you know and, and you were there um and if you were elevated you had freeboard so you, you, in two minutes you could open up the old sure, manual sure. and figure out what your rate should be now it's extremely difficult and that is not really covered they have it's not addressed at all it's an open deck so I see. so it doesn't quite fit any and so and it, there would be no factor for it it would be totally ignored in the, the, the rate but, computation. So you're saying that open deck would be ignored in the rate computation, but Absolutely. it could have a big impact on the performance of that house during the It rate. could. It could. It could have an extremely detrimental impact in that if the wave action, you know, we talked about wave uplift. Well, the wave, if it, sure. I'm not sure of the elevation of that, but let's say that's in the floodplain. Yeah. The wave action lifts that deck up just as it will a concrete sure, sure. deck on a bridge. Yeah, if it's lifting a concrete deck, it could certainly lift, lift It'll that. It'll lift that. Bridge. So what does it do? Depending on how it's connected, does that? Imp- how does that impact the column? I see. And since those columns are so high, it, it is an important question to me analytically. Because when you look at the top of that column, it's only pin connected to the wood beam. Mm. I could swear that that's from here. That looks to be a wood beam down the center. Yeah. And I'm imagining that that's only a single-sided metal clip holding that so beam. Maybe to the, not a lot of connection there. Right. Maybe, just from the column to the beam. Yeah. Hopefully that'll work for uplift, but it won't do anything for lateral load. So what happens is, is assuming that they have a, a wood floor or some other type of diaphragm action going, it it can distribute the lateral load of wind or if the waves got to the upper floor to the top of the columns, and then it would be shared more or less equally. But now the question is, is how are those columns really connected to the foundation at grade? And then, in turn, is that a just a you know four-inch slab? Is it a four-inch slab in between a grade beam grid? You know, what capacity does that have? Would one of your concerns be that the that open deck gets pushed up with the wave action and basically pushes on the the that beam area that the first floor area and well and more it would impact the columns it would I see. it could put a lateral load on the columns that they may not be designed for and again they're, they're fairly slender for that sure. vertical height how were they reinforced did an engineer actually calculate calculate that, that yeah. you know yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. did they and will it does the foundation actually have the capacity to develop that moment? And then as far as overturning and other factors, does it overload the soil? It's sure. it's not that, that simple. I see why you're saying it's so complex. There's a lot of different factors. And that's why I wouldn't want to have just a CAD operator, if you will. Yeah. You know, don't get me wrong. I, I enjoyed doing CAD drafting. I have nothing against sure, it. But, but there's that a lot of in and of itself does engineering yeah. that doesn't go into a CAD drawing. Yeah. And, you know, that doesn't qualify you to be an engineer. I wanted to break up my conversation with Scott to clarify a few things. We were talking about flood zones, and Scott mentioned that he's in a flood zone called A11, but that the community has three feet of something called freeboard, so he was changed to a flood zone called A14. What do these numbers mean? Well, Scott's referring to FEMA's A flood zone, which essentially places him inside the 100-year flood zone. The 100-year flood zone is a flood level so rare it is only equaled or exceeded on average one time every 100 years. So if you're in this 100-year flood zone and you are expected to experience rapidly flowing water or wave action, then you're actually in a zone called the V-zone or the velocity zone. Scott was saying he was with he was within the 100-year flood zone but not in a velocity zone. What about the number 11? That refers to the base flood elevation, which is FEMA's estimation of the 100-year flood height. It means that in a study at one geographic location, FEMA estimated the 100-year flood level to equal 11 feet above a datum or a vertical reference called the North American Vertical Datum of 1988. This is not quite the same as mean sea level, but in a lot of areas it's fairly close. It basically means in this area, homes on ground lower than 11 feet were in the flood zone and needed to be raised to the 11-foot mark for new construction. There's one more nuance to this story, however. 
Scott said his community requires three feet of freeboard. This is the amount of additional elevation his community requires above and beyond FEMA to be raised um, really to the required elevation. Three feet of freeboard increases the required building elevation from 11 feet to 14 feet. This is why he said his flood zone was changed to A14. He was providing the letter of the flood zone followed by the elevation of the required building. As we continued to drive, I asked Scott about his Hurricane Katrina story. He had quite a tale of survival when quick thinking saved the lives of himself and his wife. So Katrina, did the water start coming in your house? Was it all at once or was it a slow rise over time? <laughs> that, that, we were um, renting a home over in Long Beach and it was adjacent to a home that had uh, survived Camille. And as the water came up, at first, I thought, you know, uh, my wife was the first to notice the water in the yard, and then we started noticing it coming up inside the house. And so it came up in a very quick, but just a vertical fashion. The waves didn't come until the water was quite high. And then we had a portable greenhouse in the backyard, and as the waves started to come, it acted as a battering ram and took out the seaward wall. Oh, wow. which started the, the collapse of the house. However, the water came up quick enough and the waves such that we knew we had to abandon ship. So there um, was some depth to the water inside. Oh yeah, I mean there was, like I say, eight, eight plus feet of water inside as we exited. Wow. And we swam out and got in our little sailboat that we had on a trailer. And then we tried to get back to the house to break into the second floor to see if we could get our cats out, sure, sure. and we could not, uh, and then the uh, the house began, at, or then, and more of the, the waves came and pushed us away from the house into a tree, and then we watched it just totally disintegrate. The house disintegrated? Yeah. You were in the sailboat that was um, getting close to the tree, and then the tree, you said, helped almost overturn the boat, It, right? it did, yeah, we sort of got caught in it, and then the, the waves capsized us. It was actually a very stable trimaran, but since it was on a trailer, the Amas were sure. folded in, and so it wasn't that stable. So but you could find some stability and some refuge in the, in the tree for a bit, right? Yeah, we did, and then we noticed that the trimaran was floating right quite well upside down, so we clung on it for a while till the water receded yeah. enough that we could wade to, uh, to like a shore house. and the, the neighboring house where uh, the waves had knocked out the entire first floor and then went inside it until the wind subsided and uh, did your house completely disintegrate oh absolutely yeah down to the down to the slab post storm assessment when you look around are you surprised sometimes or is it pretty much what you expected the houses that survive are the ones you would have expected to survive pretty much what i expected uh, my wife and i would go through a, an exercise about you know when the next hurricane hits here you know that's going. I tell her that one's going. That one's going. That one's going. And do you think the people that live in there know that, or do a lot of times they just not. don't know? No, it? no, no. There was no clue. So, from a lot of people, probably just assume all construction's the same, and they, they don't really differentiate yeah. the way you would. See, we're a little higher, and I know that one had survived. And now we're getting into some commercial structures again. We're we're pretty high, and that structure survived. That one did. It's an old theater. They have not yet done anything to it. But whatever was here was gone. Everything on that side of the street was gone. And there's another Hancock bank made out of concrete. That one survived. Are they all made out of concrete? Their original ones were, you know, way back when. Mm -hmm. you know, that was the thing. Build it to last. Build an asset, you know, self-insure. <laughs> Build it as though you're going to insure it yourself. It's amazing how much different you would Oh, sure, build then things. you think about it very different, right? Absolutely. And I'm dragging you down this area because it's it's really bizarre to see how different the construction, the reconstruction has been. This area was hit just tremendously hard. Uh, A lot of wave once, action, right? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Wave action out the wazoo. We're, we're coming off what is the only physical relief here on this area and you know this is an old catholic church so i mean it was built out of masonry it survived um and then we come to a, a reinforced concrete 
structure here that was designed and built hell for stout. Uh, I actually had worked for the firm that had done that way back when. I wasn't there when they did it. That's how old it is. But they really did things strong. Now, see how low that one is? Yeah, yeah. Okay, now that one's higher. Yeah, look at that. And then you get a medium one. So, it, like I say, the reason I wanted to take you down this area is just to show you. Just It's bizarre. You have people building on wood columns. You have some concrete, some steel, up, down, just all over the page. Yeah, built to different levels. I'm seeing some elevators outside. People have those outdoor elevators. Yeah. I'm seeing some elevated air conditioning units that are at least 10 feet off the ground. Yeah. Things you wouldn't see in a lot of other parts of the country. Yeah, they like those uh, elevators outside that are unwalled in that they're technically only for groceries and therefore they don't have the same, the manufacturers don't have the same liability problem. Oh, I see. So people in, in theory put their groceries in that and send them up. And themselves, but and they, yeah. <laughs> see, as long as they're classified that, then sure. the manufacturer's off the hook, they feel, and then they don't have to pay as much for liability insurance and they pass that on. Yeah. But you see, there is just brand new construction and, uh, you know, it's basically wood. It's on a uh, basically a stem it appears to be a stem wall type of foundation because it looks pretty solid from here no uh, breakaway portions no columns really visible but see what's happening is is that you have a lot of these enclosures at grade that are just going to be utilized for all sorts of things outdoor uh, kitchens and, and now thanks to FEMA Art 2.0 they can be used as bedrooms Oh, really? Okay, now see there, you see an entire living level at virtually grade. Beyond it, you see something that's elevated so 16 feet. So is that feet. new policy with risk rating 2.0 that you can build the lower enclosure and have it habitable downstairs? That's what's going to happen by the insurance. Now, you might run into a problem with your local code enforcement if you're presently in a V-zone. But part of what um, the risk rating... 2.0 is is that they can enforce or rate to new flood elevations without having to do a new firm. Sure, sure. Now, yeah, a couple of years ago, maps, right? yeah, a couple of years ago, they went through and modernized all of the maps to a digitalized version. But to go through and do a flood insurance study and do all of the hydrodynamic studies and the field reconnaissance to get the transects and so on and so forth to guesstimate these firms takes a lot of money and time. But then they run up against uh, opposition to from locals. Okay, now there you, you see <clears throat> concrete construction elevated fairly high so they can change your uh, flood policy without going through the, the firm. So what will happen, oddly enough, is you're going to have older structures that were in an AE zone and have bedrooms and other things at a lower elevation, but there are some instances where they get these breaks in the insurance rates and won't be uh, risked rated at a higher risk level. So, in, in essence, there's going to be a problem where FEMA, I mean, actually, NFIP is actually in, in subsidizing weak construction. I see, where people are more at risk than what they're paying for. Yeah, and because of the way they've collected data and restricted what data they actually use in all of this... Those are concrete piles, right? Well, columns, not the piles. Columns, yeah. not, not necessarily. Now, see, that's just it. Unless you actually watch the construction, you don't know if they drove concrete piles, which a few have, or that they put in a something of a foundation and then started up with a column. I see. Oh, I see. So the, it could be the foundation maybe goes below ground to two feet above, and then the column goes about, uh, starts on that. And right. And the footing's on that foundation. And maybe the column or the pile doesn't even go into the ground. Right, the column. Is. Yeah, when when it's above ground, it's just a column. A so pile, it, technically, is really something that is in the ground. So it might continue above it, but it's definitely in the ground. And so, so a pile would really go below the ground, a column is above the ground. Right. So I'm guessing that piles are much more resilient than columns. Is that true? 
in general? No, it's a different it's purpose. I mean, te technically, a pile is a driven into the ground and typically, more often than not, just a foundation support. Now, you can get long enough piles that will protrude above grade and become columns. And so that's a driven pile column. It's a hybrid. Yeah, how does that perform in general? Well, un unless it's extremely deep and it has some sort of a grade beam system uh, near the surface or just slightly below, it won't have the same moment capacity as other type systems. Now, take a look how high these are. Wow. And then they have an independent little enclosure there. Uh, all of them do. And see, that has a steel floor system. Now, here you have a wood column system. Now, sometimes, and that looks to be... Now, that looks to be a, a driven-type pile. Now, unless they got an inordinately long piles, it's hard to imagine that those piles have much of an embedment. Sure, sure. Getting 60-foot-long piles is very costly and uh, very rare. So chances are the embedment on those is, is very, very light. So when we see really Shallow. high houses on, on high piles above ground, there's a good chance that the embedment isn't tremendous below ground. Right. right. Especially with wood. Now you can you can get 100 foot long concrete piles, but whether or not they're driven to that extent. Now here you get into yet another display of the variety here where you have these homes that are extremely elevated and then they have these interstitial floors. Now I would hazard a guess that that one right there may be near or above the, the, uh, the BFE, if you will. But if it isn't, then that becomes, at best, debris. You mean that middle layer? That middle, yeah, level where it's just a, an open deck. That could be lodged out as debris, right? And yeah. Float in the water. And depending on how it's connected, it could actually have a detrimental impact on those very slender columns. There's a lot of them, a lot of columns. They're closely spaced in the rows. That's why we often look at that lower, har lowest horizontal member, right? That can really make a difference. Uh, it, it can, but that's actually a, a, a really complicated uh, subject. The lowest horizontal member goes back to the velocity zone yeah. designations where you could get wave action on that, and it's actually the structure. This yeah. is sort of a new problem that is, has cropped up with elevating. It has you know, become popular in Florida and Alabama where... You know, they'll elevate that high, but they want to have an outside deck to, to utilize that space. I see. So the living space is elevated higher, but then they're they're putting a deck lower. Mm -hmm. And that deck, I mean, it is it is debris. Would that change the designation of the first floor elevation? No, actually, as I understand it, and I've tried my best uh, due to self interest <laughs> to continue reading on the newest rating uh, procedure. It's supposed to be simpler. Uh, Digression would be as the old system, you you only had to look up two rates. You know, it was simple. You know, what flood zone, you know, and you, know, you were there. Um, and if you were elevated, you had freeboard. So you, you, in two minutes, you could open up the old sure, manual sure. and figure out what your rate should be. Now, it's extremely difficult, and that is not really covered. They have, it's not addressed at all. It's an open deck. So, I see. so it doesn't quite fit any and classification. So, and it, there would be no factor for it. It would be totally ignored in the, the, the rate but, computation. So you're saying that open deck would be ignored in the rate computation. But Absolutely. it could have a big impact on the performance of that house during the It hurricane. could. It could. It could have an extremely detrimental impact in that if the wave action, you know, we talked about wave uplift. Well, the wave, if it... Sure. I'm not sure of the elevation of that, but let's say that's in the floodplain. Yeah. The wave action lifts that deck up just as it will a concrete sure, sure. deck on a bridge. Yeah, if it's lifting a concrete deck, it could certainly lift, lift It'll that. It'll lift that. Bridge. So what does it do? Depending on how it's connected, does that? how does that impact the column? I see. And since those columns are so high, it, it is an important question to me analytically. Because when you look at the top of that column, it's only pin connected to the wood beam. Mm -hmm. I could swear that that's from here. That looks to be a wood beam down the center. Yeah. And I'm imagining that that's only a single-sided 
metal clip holding that so beam. Maybe to the, not a lot of connection there. Right. Maybe just from the column to the beam. Yeah, hopefully that'll work for uplift, but it won't do anything for lateral load. So what happens is is assuming that they have a, a wood floor or some other type of diaphragm action going, it, it can distribute the lateral load of wind or if the waves got to the upper floor to the top of the columns and then it would be shared more or less equally. But now the question is, is how are those columns really connected to the foundation at grade? And then in turn, is that a just a you know four inch slab? Is it a four inch slab in between a grade beam grid? You know, what capacity does that have? Would one of your concerns be that the that open deck gets pushed up with the wave action and basically pushes on the the that beam area, that the first floor area, and well, and more it would impact the columns. It would, I see. it could put a lateral load on the columns that they may not be designed for. And again, they're they're fairly slender for that sure. vertical height. How were they reinforced? Did an engineer actually calculate calculate that? Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. did they? And will it, does the foundation actually have the capacity to develop that moment? And then as far as overturning and other factors, does it overload the soil? It's, sure. it's not that, that simple. I see why you're saying it's so complex. There's a lot of different factors. And that's why I wouldn't want to have just a CAD operator, if you will. Yeah. You know, don't get me wrong. I, I enjoyed doing CAD drafting. I have nothing against sure, it. But, but there's that a lot of in and of itself does engineering yeah. that doesn't go into a CAD drawing. Yeah. And, you know, that doesn't qualify you to be an engineer. I wanted to take a minute to clarify a few things Scott and I have been talking about. At one point, he mentioned FEMA's Risk Rating 2.0. This is an updated methodology that FEMA has launched to analyze and classify flood risk in a new way. When Scott said that FEMA's new rating system does not require a firm map, here's what he meant. Traditionally, a new flood rating for an area was rolled out with a robust flood risk study that produced new flood insurance rate maps, the acronym which is sometimes called FIRM. FIRM maps would designate flood maps for a section of the coast, classifying people in zones such as the A zone or the V zone, as previously mentioned. Scott was referring to the new rating system that does not require the issuing of a new FIRM map for an area. I have participated in flood workshops where practitioners have asked a lot of deep questions about this topic. So, for example, if FEMA is rating risk without rolling out brand new firm maps every time for an area, will flood maps disappear altogether? While some people say we don't need flood maps for determining risk of one house or one building, others have countered that we still need them for regulating the floodplain. For example, coming up with policies on how people must build in the highest risk areas. One thing is clear, many professionals want to get away from the quote-unquote binary system of classifying homes in or out of the flood zone. This has caused problems before because it oversimplified flood risk. Two homes both not in the flood zone may have very different risk. Imagine one of them is two miles from the edge of the flood zone, while the other one is just across the street from the edge of the flood zone. Previously, they both have been designated a similar flood designation that they're not in the flood zone, but the risk of the one right on the edge is higher than the one that's far away. It's definitely created some interesting dialogue at flood workshops and conferences. My conversation with Scott continued as we discussed more about FEMA's flood risk designation. He shared that he's concerned that they do not consider many of the nuances of construction, particularly for homes that are well built. Going back to the, the new flood risk rating method, some of the holes I see in that is, is that they don't really have enough uh, categorizations or and they don't really have enough factors to analyze what risk they have as in you know when you fill out an elevation certificate or when you're applying for insurance there's nothing in the form that tells the FEMA database how many square feet you have at this level how many square feet you have at that level how many square feet do you have on the next level if they're really is, focused on the lowest level right and and well and what, what that elevation is but maybe you just have a little bit of living space down there, right? Yeah. And actually, you know, you get into that, and then how is that actually defined? They show um, six basic 
building diagrams and variously referred to them as building diagrams or foundation types. Well, in actuality, all but one really have no depiction of what a foundation is. Sure. Just because you elevate a structure on columns, piers or piles as they call that, technically that's not the foundation. The foundation is the structure that holds up. I see. So they're kind of mis... Those structural members that hold up the building. They're like mislabeling this, really. Oh, absolutely, because the vast majority of people that were involved in that massive effort are not engineers. They're, so they're statisticians. Foundations they're what, what aren't foundations. Correct. You know, it's a building diagram, not a, a foundation. And I guess I have gotten into it so much because I fall in the cracks in between what they define as foundation. Uh, if I left things to go as they are, uh, the new risk rating method would actually increase my flood policy by sixfold, which I find a little hard to take in that that structure already took twice the hydraulic loading that the design storm would impart. It survived Katrina. Not only survived it, there was no structural damage. So this gets into being rewarded for building better, and it sounds like you're you're implying that they don't necessarily do that or don't necessarily consider some of these key components of the building structure. Yeah. They not look only a just lot for at your the, location and elevation. Right? That, that's it. That Those are the primary factors. And um, I don't see that they're collecting enough data so that they could track what their exposure is. I don't believe they have the data to understand what they really are insuring. Are they insuring, you know, 10 million square feet in the floodplain or 1 million? Actually, you know, for the design flood, I have all of 200 square feet in that floodplain. Um, I designed my home basically, uh, what was it, about 96, 97, to uh, a, a flood zone, to uh, my understanding of, of flood design then. And I came up with a structural system that is incredibly strong. I tie my grade beams and supporting our elevated carport together so that I end up with a portal frame. I have a tremendously rigid system that took on that much flood loading and did not have any structural damage. Do you feel like your home is so uniquely well built that for them they just almost can't include that into their system because there probably aren't that many designed like well, that? Well, that, you know, that's certainly an, an aspect. And, and, you know, just... Uh, another illustration would be is that they, for types of constructions, they have wood, they have masonry, and they have other. Well, mine's concrete. So what? I should be uh, classified as other, or should I be classified at least as masonry? In other words, there's some interpretation that should be involved. Sure. Well, and like we've said before, concrete does so well. It performs so well. It's so strong and durable and resilient. But a lot of people don't have it because it's they might view it as cost prohibitive. But if you do have it... There should be a reward for that, right? Maybe an insurance reduction for that. It sounds like there's no provision for it. That's correct. And, you know, for the design itself, the fact that it was designed by an engineer, built by an engineer, that sure. it has survived Katrina, it, I should be at least rated with the most beneficial factors that they have. But overall, my observations are that they're not really collecting enough data so that they can go forward sure. and, and rate things for the risk that's there. They're not truly evaluating for at least the coastal condition, the actual risk that they have. So how have you proceeded with this? If you said risk rating 2.0 was going to increase your insurance rate sixfold, did you decide at some point it's just not worth it, or how, how, how do you proceed with it? Well, uh, first and foremost, I'll try to work with my insurance agent to see if we can get um, sure. it actually submitted correctly. And then, probably no matter what, I would be contacting FEMA to give them my two cents. Sure. <laughs> I hope you do. And uh, ultimately, I want to see what the, the private market has. Yeah. True enough, with the way that it would advance, it only increases 18% a year. So it would take like 10 years before it would reach that astronomical rate. But it would impact the value of my home because it's one less selling point.
Thanks, Scott, for taking time to drive me around coastal Mississippi and show me your perspectives on how to design well for storms in this area. Scott touched on an important point in that last section that I've heard other professionals share. I've heard people say that FEMA primarily cares about your location and elevation, but does not account enough for the type of construction of buildings in flood-prone areas. For example, Scott shared that his home is made with concrete, but on FEMA's form, he did not have a provision to check that box. That's a shame because as we've said earlier in this podcast, concrete is a very resilient building material that potentially could reduce someone's risk compared to building with wood. If you enjoyed this episode of the GeoTrek podcast, come online where we discuss these podcast episodes on social media. Our Facebook group is called GeoTrek the Community. Thanks again to our faithful listeners for your support. Stay strong, safe, and resilient, and we'll catch you on the next episode of the GeoTrek podcast.